It is the Martha Zoller Show. We have so much to talk about. So much is going on. But joining me right now is Pete Sepp from the National Taxpayers Union, and we appreciate him being with us today. We're going to talk about something a little different, but then also I'm going to ask him a little bit about some of this budget talk that's going on. Going on, Pete, welcome back to the program. How are you? I am well, thank you. Good, 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 good. All right, so first of all, let's talk a little bit about this DOJ uh, trial against Google. It's really a landmark. And look, I don't like, I mean, I and I hate Google, right? But, <laughs> uh, but it is a big case. Tell us why. Well, this has been described as the antitrust case of the century in the tech industry sphere. Microsoft case in the late 1990s was the case of that century, the case of that century. I think you could fairly call this Google case the one for the 21st century. At issue is whether Google's practices of, for example, entering paid agreements with Apple and others to feature its search function primarily with various devices like Android and smartphones and whatnot, And the government is saying that is a monopolistic practice. Now, the court, of course, hearing this case with uh, Judge Mehta, had seven government arguments before it and threw out four of the government's arguments before the trial started last week. One of the arguments, a classic one. Competitors to Google, like Yelp and Travelocity, were saying, well, Our search results and our engine does not get elevated on Google's engine sufficiently, so that's unfair on Google's part. Well, that's really just sour grapes. It's uh, an argument that uh, has long been discredited in the retail world, for example, when Costco has the Kirkland brand advertised prominently in its own stores. Uh, That is not anti-competitive behavior. That's the way these stores work. Uh, Google was behaving exactly the same way. The government was right to throw out those charges. But now we're getting into the meat of the trial. And there have been wins and losses on both sides, both the government side and the competitors who are egging on the government, egging on the government and Google's side. So what do you think... um is I mean, what's the biggest concern now? I you know because there's always a lot of things that are said about Google about what they amplify and what they don't amplify and how you get fined. I kind of just look at it is that I threw my privacy away about 20 years and I decided to get involved in social media and all kinds of things. So I don't really worry about Google that much because yes. I figure they just you know I don't have anything. My grandmother told me a long time ago, don't do anything that you wouldn't want to see on the front page of the newspaper. And I try to um you know follow that that rule so that anything you're going to find out there out there about me is either true or somebody's clipped it and made it look like something but I have no control over it and so I don't worry about it so is there evidence of any consumer harm because that's what the DOJ is saying yeah there's zero evidence of consumer harm Consumer harm, consumer harm would be in a case where, for example, somebody paid for a search service and didn't get the service that they paid for. Well, Google is free to the user. It is supported by advertising. There's no consumer harm in something that they're not getting charged for. That seems to most people. It isn't to the government. The government is saying, well, consumers could be harmed down the line if Google continues its dominance in the search market. Well, Google isn't continuing its dominance in the search market for the foreseeable future because it has competitors in other ways, in other ways and other platforms. Amazon, for example, where people can conduct searches or through Facebook. TikTok is rising and developing new kinds of applications. So those are all competitive pressures. We need to remember that Google was not the search monopoly ever uh, from the beginning. Yahoo, for example, had two-thirds of all searches uh, up through 2006. Google came up on Yahoo and surpassed it, now has a dominant market share. You go even further back, MySpace 
was the dominant presence online. Polls in the New York Times in the 2000s saying, will MySpace dominate the internet forever? Well, hardly anybody ever uses MySpace anymore. The internet is a changing thing. Um, so many parts of our economy are dynamic and changing. And antitrust prosecution prosecutions historically have never kept up with it. They're even further behind when it comes to tech. Do you, uh, what do you think is going to ultimately happen? Well, you take a look at the opening blows in this trial. Google attempted to exclude Jonathan Enter, the Department of Justice's lead uh, attorney on this case, because in private practice, he had gone after Google on behalf of its rivals and had to recuse himself uh, from the case initially when he got in government. Google lost that motion. On the other hand, the government tried to suppress evidence, as evidence that Google had internally showing that its product was superior to others and people chose it by preference. Government lost on that count. On the other hand, Apple, a witness in the case, has called out the government for implying that statistics the government, how much uh, Apple and Google are paying uh, for this agreement, uh, that is confidential information. And so Apple is upset about the implication that they're leaking information. Uh, these are all things that are going to be swirling around until we get to the meat of the arguments. I don't think it's I don't think the government can prevail here if the judge, Amit Mehta, has the facts at hand, weighs them properly, and applies the consumer welfare standard, the long-standing standard in antitrust to this case. So let's put your other hat on, your taxpayer hat. Uh, there's some talk about a deal on uh, this spending deal to avert a shutdown. Their, Congress says they're going to stay in for the next, you know, until the end of the month every day. Um, the, the House has passed 12 appropriations bills and sent them over to the Senate. And the Senate, you know, thinks that they should be, should, they should be, should be spending their time on their dress code and not on the, the 12 appropriations bills. And uh, so it looks like they're leaning towards some kind of a 30-day stopgap so they can keep working on this. But what are your thoughts about it? My guess is they will do a 30-day, perhaps even longer, stopgap spending measure because the House and the Senate are still far apart on some of the actual numbers for appropriations. Yes, they've both completed a lot of work on appropriations. That doesn't mean that both chambers have agreement, and that's to be expected. One chamber, the upper one is run by Democrats, though very closely, very narrowly. Uh, the House Similarly, a narrow margin for Republicans. They're going to have different priorities. Once again, though, Martha, why in the world could they not have begun these discussions sometime in, instead of having to wait until the last minute? Or, or this, go ahead and three months ago, you know, appoint conference committees to work on yes. this negotiation. I mean, they haven't yes. even done that yet. They act like that's not even a tool at their disposal. And yes. it's just ridiculous because, as you pointed out, the 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 Senate is Democrat control, but by one seat. The House is Republican control, but by basically the same margin, four seats. That's one. You know, they have 400 House of Representatives. So four seats is like one seat in the Senate. OK, so it's basically the same mix, just different people controlling it. I think you'd put a conference committee together and get this work done. Yeah, absolutely. And to the House's credit, they have passed appropriations bills with some excellent policy riders in them for taxpayers. I mean, we can set aside all of the other social policy riders, but for example, other example, uh, there's a limitation on student loan repayment waivers. That's challenging the Biden administration. We're talking about hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in the next year alone that that could save taxpayers if it carries. There's a, a draconian new independent contract Department of Labor, a rule that would destroy the franchising model that helps small businesses get ahead. There's uh, a rule 
um, that the Biden administration put out, as well as the IRS, uh, a project actually allowing the IRS to get into the tax preparation business. Nation's uh, bill says, no, the IRS can't do that. Those are the kinds of things they should have started negotiating over months ago. They probably could have made them stick in a less hectic environment. You know, I'm watching very closely the Virginia elections uh, that are happening this year. Uh, you know, Glenn Youngkin, obviously, they have this weird situation in Virginia where you have one term, right, for governor. But he's done a lot, and he has has really changed the messaging for Republicans in Virginia. And if he has a big November where he gets control back for his final two years, I mean, that's that's going to be a model you know, I mean, forget about whether he'll run for president someday. I don't know if he will or he won't. But that's going to be a real model for how to get things done and how to communicate and win. Yes, absolutely. This is how you push the taxpayer agenda forward in a purple state. And Virginia is no longer reliably red. Glenn Youngkin has done an excellent job doing incremental tax reforms and reductions as well as incremental steps toward keeping the budget under control. People deride that. They say it's not conservative enough. We need to be bold. Well, yes, but you also have to read your political environment. And if you adjust your agenda, if you put some priorities first that everybody can agree on, get through some additional priorities that are a little more contentious, do it bit by bit, and you have a fiscally conservative platform for governing and lots of people get surprised by how well Virginia is doing. We you shouldn't know, and, be. And Pete, he's likable and he communicates well. There is something, yes. you know, and that's not something you can teach, really. I mean, you can teach the communication part of it. Okay, but that likability like Reagan had, like, you know, Bill Clinton, for that matter, had. It's this, it's this ability to connect, even though he's an uber successful person, a lot of people would think, oh, I don't have nothing in common with this rich guy. But he's one of those guys that sits on a couch and you feel connected. Yes, absolutely. And it's important to remember the left, our opponents, don't necessarily get the huge wins all the time. They do things incrementally, too. I can count on one hand the big bills on the federal level they that never the left give up has won. Too. Pete, they never That's give right. up. <laughs> they are persistent and, in, and incremental. They are. Pete Sepp, National Taxpayers Union. Any other little things we need to wrap up here? Just very importantly, the Internal Revenue Service funding is also at issue in this appropriations fight. We need to make sure that we put guardrails on that funding, that respect tax, that emphasize taxpayer service, rather than throwing more money at enforcement that's going to hurt us all. That is a key battle in this upcoming fight. Absolutely. Pete Sepp, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure.